Now, this passage comes from a scene that we commonly refer to as the triumphal entry. We normally save this passage and read it around uh, Passion Week, uh, Palm Sunday in particular, because this is a record of what happened to Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem the week of his passion or his death. He rode in on a donkey, and as he was riding in, the people lined the streets, and they threw their cloaks out in front of this donkey, and they cut branches. Another passage tells us they were palm branches. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. And they threw those down on the ground, and Jesus rides in. Now, for you and I that maybe don't know much about Near East history, we, we culture, we don't maybe understand this. It just is a nice kind of parade. But what is going on here is, is this was symbolic of what they did for kings who came back from a great victory. The people would line the street after a king had got a great victory and the, the uh, king would be riding on a horse and all his uh, army would be following and they would be throwing things into the street and throwing flowers. And this was symbolic of that. And what these people are yelling, Hosanna, the Hebrew is Hosanna. And it means save now. But what you might miss too is what comes after that. Hosanna to the son of David. That was a title that was understood to be the title for the coming King Messiah. The son of David meant literally the offspring of or the relative of David. And the people knew based on the Old Testament that the king, the Messiah, would someday come through David's line, the great king, David. And so when they refer to him as the son of David, they're saying, save now, king. That's what they're saying. These folks wanted a king. Probably, again, more than we understand, because they were in the clutches of Roman domination. Rome had for many years been ruling over the, no, the, uh, the, the known world at that time. Israel was a part of their empire. They didn't want to be controlled by Rome. They wanted Rome out, and they were hoping that the Messiah king would show up to kick Rome out of Israel. These people had heard Jesus. They had seen Jesus. They were convinced, many of them, that he was this king that they had longed for. He was this king that they wanted. They were convinced that this one would organize the people and overthrow Rome, and they would once again be the great Israel of old, ruled by a descendant of David. And so when we see these folks shouting and excited, they are excited because they believe the king has come. Amazingly enough, just a few days later, Jesus is arrested, put on a religious trial, then put on a political trial before Pilate, the governor appointed by Rome, and then he's executed. And above his head, nailed to the cross, Pilate had the words written, Jesus, King of the Jews. Now, it was common for a criminal in those days when they were crucified that the, um, that the charge against them was written on a paper and placed over the person being killed so that everybody would see why they were being killed and it would deter people from, from doing whatever that was, murder or multiple uh, crimes. But for Jesus, it said king of the Jews. Folks, it's amazing. The people in Jesus' day wanted a king. They wanted a king. I mean, this scene proves that they wanted a king. 
They believed that Jesus might be the king. But when all of a sudden it turned and they started to think, no, maybe he's not because he's not, he's not fighting. They, 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 they came and arrested him in the garden and he didn't fight. What are you talking about? A king fights. A king would have fought. What is going on? This guy must not be the king that we're looking for. They wanted a king, but they didn't want a savior. And you know, the ironic thing about it, as I looked at this and thought about this, those folks wanted a king, but they weren't looking for a savior. Many today want a savior, but they don't want a king. Many people that go to church, that call themselves followers of Jesus, Christians, want a savior. They want somebody to... Make sure that they're not going to spend eternity in hell. But they don't necessarily want a king to rule over their life. And so the question on the floor this morning is, do you really want a king? Oh, I know, I know. You want a savior. I do too. I don't want to spend eternity in hell. And when the, the prospect of that was posed to me many years ago and the gospel was given and I understood that I couldn't save myself and that I needed a savior and that savior was Jesus, the perfect one who died on the cross to take the punishment that I should have taken. He took it for me so that I could have my sin forgiven. I readily said yes. And I know many of you are there as well. But the question this morning is, is not do you want a savior? The question this morning is do you want a king? And so as we move our way through this this morning, I, I want you to think about that. I want you to ask yourself that, do I really want a king? And if you do, here's one, number one. If you really want a king, then number one, you've got to submit to him as king. You have to submit to him as king. We don't see this word submit in this exact form in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, every time we come up with the word submit, uh, well, I shouldn't say every time, most every time we come up to the word submit in the New Testament, it's a Greek word, uh, hupotazo, and it means to line up underneath. It was a military term used of rank. You would line up in rank. And so when you submit to the king, what you're saying is, is your king and I am subject. Your king, I am not. Your king and I will put myself under your kingship. That's what submit means. And in order to do that, to submit to him as king... There's got to be, number one, a recognition of his right to rule. So, before we look at this scripture, let me explain something to you. This is a hard concept for us because we're not run by a king. We live in a, Republican, uh, a republic, a democracy, where we have representatives. Well, let me, can I change that? We have supposed representatives who are supposed to represent us in a central government. We have no king. We have an elected president, but we have no king. Most of us, probably all of us in here this morning, have never grown up in a monarchy. There's very few monarchies left, and, and there's maybe only one or two real monarchies left. And so for us to think about a king, it, it's, it's very, very foreign to our mind. But you got to understand, a king, a monarch, in the sense that Scripture uh, is giving it to us, is an absolute ruler. He answers to no one. He has no, no Senate. He has no Congress. He has no Parliament. He has no uh, uh, advisors. He is sole ruler. Now, in our world today, we would call somebody like that a dictator. And see, when I said that, you thought negative thoughts, didn't you? 
See, because we do. Because when we think about putting that kind of a, a power into the hands of the average human, no matter how good they are, something's going to go bad. It may not go bad with them. They may be one of the most unusual individuals and they may actually be a benevolent dictator and do really good, but they're not going to last forever. They're going to die. It's going to be handed off to somebody else. Guarantee they're going to go bad. Somewhere along the line, that kind of power goes bad. That's why we don't have monarchies anymore. And so for us to think about a king with absolute power, a, a dictator, it just gives us, oh, I don't know. I don't, but I want you to understand that's exactly what we're talking about. Colossians 2, 9 through 10, it should be there in your notes. It says this, for in, uh, in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Let me stop there. This is such an amazing statement. If you get nothing else this morning, understand what that is saying. Christ, in Christ, lives all the fullness of God in a human body. God, who is spirit, the Bible tells us he is spirit, right? You say, what is that? I don't know, but I know what it's not. It's not Casper. It's not a ghost floating through the air. Spirit is non-physical. That's why scripture also tells us that no one has seen God at any time. Physical cannot see the spiritual. God is spirit. And so in order for God to come and be the sacrifice for our sin, it was the way we understand it, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, who is God in his fullness, but in bodily form. It's an amazing statement. Verse 10. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. If you've trusted Christ as Savior, you've been, the Bible says, unified with him. Who is the head over every ruler and authority? Who is the head? Jesus is the head. Over what? Everything. Every ruler, every authority, he is it. That's what it's saying. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. W what is that saying? That every knee in heaven and earth and under the earth, in other words, he's just covering all the bases, and he's saying that Jesus is Lord over everything, everywhere, it's all his. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. The universe and everything is his kingdom. He is the king. He has the right to rule because he's king. He is absolute monarch. See, that's kind of scary. It's only scary because we put it in human terms. And we know that there is no human monarch that is totally good. And so we think, man, you put that kind of power in somebody's hands and they're bound to go bad. But you got to understand... He is God. He is good. And he has the right to rule. And you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to bow our knee to his kingship now. But every day, everybody will one day do it. Everybody will one day recognize that he truly is Lord. Here's the problem, though. Many people who call themselves Christians... They're, they're, they're comfortable, like I said, with the idea that Jesus is Savior, but that position of king, I don't know. See, because it's, it's something we've inherited. It goes all the way back to the garden, and we looked at this the first week, but I want to make reference to it again because it's so important here. That whole scene where the serpent tempts Eve... You remember that whole deal? We looked at it a couple weeks ago. Serpent shows up. He begins to question Eve about what God said. Hey, has God said? And Eve said, well, yeah, no. He said we could eat any fruit that we wanted, but, but the fruit of the, the tree in the middle of the garden, we can't eat it or touch it or we're certainly going to die. The day that we eat it, we're going to die. In Genesis 3, 5, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So what is it that Satan's dangling in front of her? He, he's telling her that eating the fruit is an opportunity to be like God. In, in so many words, he says this, look, Eve, you're not going to die. God knows that the day you eat from this fruit, you're going to be just like he is. Well, what is that? You're going to be a God. Knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil? Yeah, another way to say that is, you're going to be able to make your own rules. God knows the day you eat from this fruit, you're going to be just like him. You are going to be a God, and you can make your own rules, Eve. You can God your own life. You can be your own king. That's exactly what Satan was offering here. And Eve took it. We know the story. She gives it to Adam. He's standing right there. He eats because he doesn't want to be left without part of this kingship deal. And it all starts going downhill. But, but what happens in the process? Well, what happens in the process is we inherited, Scripture says, Adam and Eve's sin nature. Well, what is at the core of their sin nature? They wanted to be their own king and queen. They wanted to be their own rulers. And so you incorporate that into our lives and you say, Jesus wants to be the king of your life. And there's a part of this that goes, I don't know if I want that. Why? Because we inherently want to be our own ruler. We want to make our own rules. We don't want to give that control to anybody, including God. We may not say it, but if we're honest, when we start talking about God being an absolute monarch in our lives, it makes us bristle a little bit. We're a little nervous. Why? Because we have inherited from Adam and Eve that desire to be our own king. Those articles that I read to you earlier, what is going on there? It's society saying, no, no, we will not follow God's plan. We will not follow this script. We are writing our own script. We are making our own plan. We will rule our own lives. And so for us to think that we're not going to struggle with that as followers of Jesus Christ we're kidding ourselves. It's, it's a part of our nature. And yes, Christ died to set us free from that, but there is, a, there is a struggle. And so the first thing, if you really want a king in your life, you have to recognize his right to rule. He is king. And, and you've got to submit to his authority. Here's number two. You've got to accept the fullness of his rule. The fullness of his rule. See, there are a lot of folks who identify themselves as Christians who don't want to live kingdom lives all the time. They don't want the full rule of God in their lives. They're okay with it on Sunday morning or at a Bible study or when I run into somebody that I know from church, I can, you know. But I don't want his kingship in my life all the time. I mean, there's some things I want to, I want to control, and the reality is, if you want a king, this king, it's about giving him full authority. The king of the Iwi people of Ghana in Africa is a guy named King Bansa. I am probably butchering all this stuff, but just bear with me. It's true, by the way. Interestingly enough, King Bansa doesn't live in Africa. He lives in Germany. When he was a young man, his grandfather, who was the king at the time, sent him off to Germany to train to be a mechanic, an auto mechanic. When he finished training to be a mechanic, he decided to stay in Germany and open his own mechanic shop, which he did. He became very successful. A number of years later, his grandfather, the king, died. And Bansa inherited the throne. He became the king. But he didn't want to leave Germany. He didn't want to leave his mechanic shop. 
And so he decided he would stay living in Germany, keep his mechanic shop going, and he would just go down to Ghana several times a year to rule the country. And literally, he's become known as the part-time monarch. He's a full-time mechanic and a part-time monarch. I know it sounds crazy, but look it up if you don't believe me. It's a real story. This guy goes down several times a year, puts on the, all the traditional garb of the king of his people, and he does whatever those kings do, and then he gets back on a plane, and he goes back to Germany to his mechanic shop. He's a full-time auto mechanic who fixes cars and a part-time king. And when I read that, I thought to myself, that's what so many Christians want. We don't want a full-time monarch in our life. We don't want a full-time. We want a part-time king. We want a king when it's convenient. We want a king when it works. And the rest of the time, we want to rule our own lives. We want to be our own king and queen. And what happens with that? When you king your own life, when you rule your own life, you are bound to mess up. You are bound to break down. That's when we want him to be a full-time mechanic. We want him to step into our lives and fix what's broken, and then we go back to being our own king and queen again. We don't want a full-time king. Most of us, if we're honest, we want a part-time monarch in our life. And we want the convenience of him also being able to fix what's broken when we screw it up. And I know that might be tough to hear, but I see it so many times, folks. And then we make bad choices and screw up and mess up, and we have the audacity to say, what is God doing to me? And I'll tell you what he's doing. He's letting you rule your own life. He's letting you be your own monarch. And with that, you get everything that goes along with it. I don't want to do marriage like I don't want to love my wife like Christ loved the church. That means i got to sacrifice for her. Okay, then don't. Rule your own life. Do your marriage your own way. Be your own king in your marriage, and you get all of that goes with that. I don't, I don't want to be this kind of a woman that does what God's saying here. I, I want to do it my way. I think my way is better. Okay, go ahead. God is going to let you do that. He will let you rule your own life. But then be ready to take all the junk that goes along with it as you screw up your own rulership. Because that's what's coming. And I would be less than loving if I didn't say these things to you. We don't mind submitting to God's rule in our lives as long as it's convenient. I don't mind submitting to God and letting Him be my king on Sunday. Well, as long as there aren't two good teams playing. And, and I don't... I don't mind submitting to God and letting him God and rule my life, be the king in my life with certain things, like big decisions, you know, buying cars and stuff like that. But my eating habits, no, I'm not going to let him. What I drink, who I party with, I can handle that. I'll rule that area of my life. And God will say, okay, have at it. But you get everything that goes with it. You get what comes with being your own monarch. And you don't have to be a genius to look around you and see so many people kinging and queening their own lives and the destruction and the pain and the hurt as a result. And if that's, if that's what you want, then God will let you have that. See, so many times we think it's God punishing and God, God will just let you live out the course that you've chosen. You say, why would he do that? Because he loves you. And if you don't want him in your, his, in your life, if you don't want him to king your life, he, he won't do it. He's not going to force himself on you. So if you don't want him, he's going to step out, but he's also going to let you experience everything that goes along with that. If, if, if you really want a king in your life, it means submitting to him as king. Here's the second thing. It means trusting him as king. 
Trusting him as king? Yeah. Knowing, first of all, that he rules in truth. You got this classic scene where Jesus has is, is been on trial before the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. Now he's on trial before Pilate. And Pilate begins to question him. Are you a king? And, and, and Jesus gives him this answer in John 18, 36. My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were... My followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, my kingdom does not have its origin here. It's a heavenly kingdom. Pilate said, so you're a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and I came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. See, here's the deal. You've got to trust the king if you're going to let him king your life. And you've got to believe that he's going to rule you in truth. He's never going to lie to you. He's never going to deceive you. He's always going to give you the truth. When Satan came to Eve, part of his strategy was to try to get Eve to think that God was being deceptive. You're not surely going to die. He knows that the day you eat of it, you're going to be just like he is, and you can rule your own life. It was all a deception. It was all a lie. And Eve fell for it. Why? Because Eve had to have come to a place where she believed that you can't trust God. You, you can't really trust him. I mean, all she had to do was look around and see everything that God had provided for him. But in that one moment, when she was standing there contemplating what was being offered, she had to have come to a place where she thought, man, I just can't trust God on this one. Titus 1-2 says this, this truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, listen to this, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. He rules in truth, in truth. And would you put this down? Satan rules in deception. This is an amazing verse. 1 Timothy 4.1. Listen to what it says. The Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, listen, the last times, when is that? It's right now. Everything from the time when Jesus ascended back into heaven until the time he returns in Scripture, and we don't have time to look at it right now, but that's the last times. We are living in the last times. So what will happen in the last times? Some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits, and listen to this, teachings that come from demons. We talk about doctrine in the church all the time. Man. We're about doctrine. Doctrine is just teaching that is from God's word. That's what we mean when we talk about doctrine. But did you know that demons have doctrine? Demons have teaching? Demons are trying to reprogram the kingdom of this world to think along their lines. They are trying to turn God's order upside down. Let me give you an example. They, 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 they want it to sound good, so they package it in certain types of words. But do, a doctrine of demon would sound something like this. Hey, we, pick, we care about our kids, and we don't want them to have to deal with the adult responsibilities before they're able to deal with them. And so we need to hand out condoms so that they don't get pregnant and have to deal with adult responsibilities because we care about them so much. It sounds caring. But you know what it is? It's Satan's desire for our kids to live an immoral lifestyle and to destroy their lives, going from one partner to another partner to another partner. That's the doctrine of demons. Here's, here's another example. Because we care about people's feelings and because we don't want to be judgmental, we don't want to judge others, we need to allow people to use whatever bathroom facility they feel comfortable and that corresponds with how they view themselves. It sounds 
somewhat caring and compassionate, but it's taking God-made gender and distorting it and blurring it and eventually just obliterating it. That's doctrine of demons, folks. Anything that takes God's kingdom rule and God's kingdom order and twists it, hey, kids don't need a dad. Kids don't even need a mom. They just need, you know, they just need like people around, anybody around them we can call family. That's all they need. They don't need a nurturing home. They don't need a nuclear home. That's ridiculous. <laughs> See, that's, that's doctrine of demons. See, God as king, as ruler, he will rule in truth and he will tell you what you don't want to hear. Because it's true. Satan will come along and he'll tell you anything you want to hear, anything that he believes will get you to a point where you will do whatever you want to do to rule your own life and eventually be destroyed. Because the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's his goal. You have to, number two, know that he rules in love. See, here's the thing. When, when we think about a monarch, an absolute monarch, it bristles us and it scares us because, like I said, as a human monarch, we know that there's going to be mistakes. There's going to, you don't put that kind of power into the hands of a human. That's true, but we're not talking about a human. We're talking about the God of the universe, King of kings, Lord of lords. And he rules based on truth and love. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know we're familiar with it, but listen, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for dis disaster, to give you future and a hope. Those are the words of a loving God. Now let me tell you the context in which he said those. Israel was in captivity. They were in Babylon in captivity. Why? Because they didn't want God to rule. They wanted an earthly ruler, an earthly king. God said, okay, I'm going to give you a king, but you're going to get everything that goes along with it. Check it out in 2 Samuel. It's there. And so what came with that is the king, uh, the different kings eventually led them away from God and they worshipped all kinds of other gods and as a result, disaster. So they are experiencing the disaster of wanting to king their own lives, of wanting to choose their own rulers. And God comes in through the prophet Jeremiah and he says, I am going to uh, provide freedom for you eventually because I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. That's a loving God. Because in the midst of their, their being, uh, uh, dealing with the consequences of their own ruling, he says, my plans for you, they're good for a future and a hope. And God looks at us as the king and he says, I love you. And I have good for you. And I want to I wanna, I wanna demonstrate that love for you. And we think we buy into Satan's trick like he tricked Eve we think I don't know if I can trust God with that. I, I know he's loving but I'm not sure this this is a loving thing it doesn't seem I want to do this and if he really loved me he'd let me do this Romans 5 8 says this God showed us his love demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us folks listen to that when we were sinners we didn't turn to God, we didn't want God, we didn't acknowledge God. It was at that point that Jesus died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to think with me for a minute. If God loved you that much to die for you when you were still a rejecter of him, why would you ever think that he wants to screw up your life after you turn to him? Amen. It doesn't make any sense. If he loves you enough that he would send his son to die for you, then he obviously has good plans for you. But the enemy comes along and says, no, 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 you, oh, he, you can't trust God in this area. Oh, you know what? Trust him in all these other areas, but not this one. Not with your relationships. 
because he's not living your relate. You are, and you know what's best. So you rule this part of your life and let God rule the other parts of your life. And then we start to actually believe that he's not as loving and as trusting as he could be. Would you put this down for number three? What this comes down to is you trust him. Look at this. No matter what. We don't have time to look at it, but, and some of you are familiar with the story, and if you're not, please go look at it later this afternoon. It won't take you very long. Daniel chapter 3. There's three guys in this story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are Jewish captives in Babylon. And there's this king, and he's kind of a egotistic guy and he builds this statue this huge statue and overlays it with gold and he makes this proclamation at the sound of the band when the band starts playing and you hear that music you need to drop wherever you're at and you need to be facing toward this statue and you need to worship it and so the music would play, the band would start playing, the people would drop, but there was these three guys, these, these guys that were allowing God to be king in their lives, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, man, we can't do this. We can't. So they stood there while everybody else is bowing. Well, of course, somebody didn't like that. They go back to the king and they say, king, you got these guys, they're not bowing. He gets all upset. He says, have them come to me, brings them in front of him. And he says, hey, is it true? that you guys aren't doing this. And let me tell you something. We can take care of this real quick. Next time the band starts playing, you drop, bow, we'll forget about this whole deal. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing in front of the most powerful man in the world. This was Nebuchadnezzar. This was the most powerful man in the known world at that time. And they said, King, you do what you need to do. This is, of course, Randy's paraphrase. <laughs> King, you do what you need to do. We're not going to bow. Even, even if God allows us to be burned up, O king, we're not going to bow. You say, how? How could the, the most powerful king, monarch in the world, and they're standing in front of him saying, we're not going to allow you to rule our lives because we have a bigger king than you. That's what they were saying. Well, the king gets all torqued. And he has the fire uh, heated up seven times. It's so hot that as they're taking, as the guys that um, are taking these three in to throw them in, it's so hot on the outside of the furnace, they die as they're throwing Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in. When you get down near the end of the story, Nebuchadnezzar, strongest, most powerful monarch in the known world at the time, is sitting there looking into the furnace. And as he looks in, he says, hey, hey, can we throw three guys into the furnace? And they said, well, yeah, king, you were here. You saw the whole thing. He goes, why do I see three of them walking around loose? And there's a fourth one. And that fourth one, I swear, looks like the son of a god. See, folks, let me tell you something. I read a story like that. I look at that story and I go, wow, these guys are amazing. Standing in front of the most powerful monarch in the known world and said, sorry, king, don't mean to be disrespectful, but you're not the ultimate king. We have a king bigger than you, and that's the king that we're going to serve. To the point, they were willing to stand to the point to get thrown into the fire. And who shows up in the fire? The king! The king shows up! See, they had an opportunity to say, we, no matter what, we're going to trust our king. He's a king of truth. He's a king of love. And if he lets us die, he's got to have a good reason because he's a God of truth and he's a God of love. He's a king of truth and he's a king of love. And so, king, no matter what, we're not going to allow you to rule our lives because this is wrong. We can't worship you. We only worship the true king. And so because they were willing to not allow the rulership of a false king to be a part of their lives, they got a chance to experience the true king right before them. Folks, I wonder how many times we miss 
an opportunity to experience the King of Kings in our lives because we bend and fold to allowing ourselves or someone else to rule the day in our situation. See, what that story tells me is that what you and I need to do when it comes to wanting a king is we've got to get to a point where we trust him no matter what. Man, it looks bad. It doesn't, it doesn't look like this is going to turn out good. Trust him. But, but I don't know. I mean, it, I, what if and what if? So we love to do that, right? We play the what if game and we get all the scenarios. Trust him. But I don't know. He's a loving king. But I'm not sure. He's a king of truth. Trust him. Trust him. You want a king? You want a king? You got to trust him. And here's the last one. Glorify him as king. Glorify him as king? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He lives in you and was given to you by God. You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor slash glorify God with your body. What's he saying? He's saying this, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, God the Spirit, lives within those of us who have trusted Christ as Savior. The presence of the King lives in us. That's what it means that we're the temple, we're His hangout is what it means. And so because of that, he says, man, the way you live your life, bring honor to Him, glorify Him, listen, make Him look good. That's what it means to glorify him. Make him look good. When you and I make our king look good, other people go, whoa. Maybe, maybe that's the king I should have in my life. Nebuchadnezzar stood there and he said, hey, didn't we throw three guys in there all tied up? Now they're walking around and there's a fourth guy. And you know what eventually happens to Nebuchadnezzar? Read the rest of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar comes to believe that God is king, even over him. See, when you and I live in such a way that we glorify the king who we say we want to serve, man, the kingdom shows up. And it truly can be said, like Jesus said, the kingdom is in our midst. I don't like to shop. I didn't use the H word. I don't like to shop. I, I know it's, it's one of those necessary evils, but I don't like it. I know because, and you all can sympathize with me because we live on Molokai, I know that when we go off island, no matter what it's for, somewhere in that mix there has to be shopping but I don't like it. I have to gear myself up for it. They made Amazon for guys like me. But there is one part of shopping that I don't mind. When you go to Costco, there are these people they set up at various parts of the store with samples. Sometimes they're cooking the sample, and you can smell it from a long way away, and you're going, oh, baby, I'm going to find that sample station. And when you get there, they don't give you a full meal. Now, if you time it right and you get to the different station, you can walk out and you're done. But they don't give you a full meal. They just give you a little sample because the sample is supposed to whet your appetite so that you want the full deal. You'll go to wherever it is on that aisle and go, man, give me a whole bunch of that because the little sample was really good. You following what I'm saying? You and I are supposed to be samples of the kingdom. And when people see us and the way we live our lives and what God is doing in our lives, they go, oh, I'd like a whole portion of that deal where did you get that? Who is your king? So the question this morning is, do you really want a king? Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?